One thing's for sure. I'm a new creation in Jesus. How about you? Come with me this morning, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to pick up our speaking through this book of 1 Corinthians. I've enjoyed it immensely. I hope it's helped you and been a benefit to you. Uh, I don't want to uh, forget to say that the beautiful flowers here are a memorial to Miss Lucille uh, Morgan that went to be with Jesus a couple of weeks ago. We had a memorial service for her yesterday at a packed house. Uh, I am so, so, so thankful to you ladies that uh, worked so hard uh, to pair up prepare an incredible meal for that many people and uh, we had food left over so I'm grateful to you but these are a memorial to Miss Lucille. If you want to see more, if the drugstore is open tomorrow I'll have her Duke wreath put back up there and uh, have a picture over there on her table and there will be a ticket there where I've paid for her meal. Uh, I'll pay it forward one more time. So, uh, We'll miss her, but well, I wouldn't take anybody back from heaven, would you? Yeah. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. First Corinthians 13. I want to read to you verses 8 through 13 in a moment. But before I do, I want to go back to last week and talk a little bit about what Paul, as he introduced us in the first few verses of this chapter, he, he tries to explain to us the nature of of God's love. The nature of God's love. God's love and its nature taught us, number one, that love's first concern is for other people. Is it God's love, when I exhibit God's love, it's not focused on me. It's not focused on what I want. It's focused on other people. It's what Jesus did on the cross one day when he looked out to a group of people that crucified him and said, Father, forgive them. And he says, I love you. And he said it by dying on the cross for their sins. The nature of God's love is that God's love has as his first concern other people, not ourselves. Love's contentment. We learn from what Paul has said that it's not selfish. That love is content with what it is that you and I would not be egotistical. We would not become mad or enraged. But it, in fact, we would exhibit just the opposite of that. We would exhibit concern and care and forgiveness. Love's conviction is, is that it never changes. Say this with me. Love never changes. Love never changes. It forbears, it forgives, it's faithful, Paul said. And Paul closes out the nature of love and he says that love is going to endure absolutely everything. And let me tell you something, that's important. Why is it important that love endures everything? Because he is introducing us to some things that will pass away. Some things that are not going to endure. So let's look the subject of love's nobility, I call it. Verse 8. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there are tongues, they'll cease. Whether there is knowledge, it'll vanish away. For we know in part. We prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know just as I also am known. And now, say this last one with me. And now, abideth faith, hope, and love. These three... But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. Absolutely. Paul talks about that which is passing. Love never fails. Love endures. 
But he gives us a definite expectation that something is going to pass. And guess what that is? Some of the gifts. Some of the gifts that God by his Holy Spirit had gifted this church at Corinth, some of those gifts were going to cease. They were going to fail. They were going to end. Think with me, folks. Go back and think about this church and all that they have gone through and all that Paul has addressed. <laughs> And God gave these spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit. He implanted these gifts into the lives of all of these church members for one thing. You know what it was? To build the church up. So that they would be a mighty voice for God in this community that they lived in that was so ungodly. They needed all the Holy Spirit could put in them to be able to do that. But here's what they had done. They had taken all of these incredible gifts that God had given them. Instead of using that to build up the church and the kingdom of God, they were building themselves up. And guess what? When you build yourself up, you can bet your bottom dollar you're tearing the church of Jesus Christ down. If you're a member of this church and you're building yourself up, know that you're knocking something out off of its feet in this body of Jesus Christ. Love builds up. But me, partiality, selfishness, unforgiveness, guess what? I'm tearing down somebody. So instead of building up this body, they had taken these spiritual gifts and they were tearing each other apart. And these gifts were soon to be obsolete. Paul wants them to know that they're going to end, but... Love was never going to end. Sadly, they were so obsessed with the gifts, they actually stopped loving one another. They were so in love with the gift that they had. They had fallen out of love with the one that gave them the gift, Jesus. They had gotten so full of themselves and so in love with what they had that they were like a bunch of kids getting their favorite toy and there ain't no way in the world my brother or sister is going to touch it. Remember that? I don't think kids do that anymore, do they? Does that ever happen? Oh, it does? Okay. Let me tell you what happened. Because they had done so much destruction. You know what Paul does here? Listen, to Paul puts love back on the throne. <coughs> he wants to tear down all of this selfishness and fussing and fighting. And he wants to put love back up on the pedestal that it belongs on. Love is the one thing in this universe on which we can count on. Love. The, love is the very stuff that eternity is made of. You understand that? It belongs to the ages. Time is going to fall one of these days. The created universe, this created world that we live in, is going to fail one of these days. It's going to be burned up. But the stars in the sky that we see at night, they're going to fall out of their place. But love is never going to fail. Amen. So you know what that means? That if I am going to love others that the way God loves you, that means my love for you will never fail. Listen to me, folks. You will never, ever do anything to me. Never do anything to me as your pastor, shepherd, that I'll never be able to, to stop loving you. Never. You may kick my chicken. <laughs> You, you, you may take one of my rabbits. You may speak harshly to my wife. You may steal my deer stand. <laughs> but I'm not going to stop loving you. Because I choose, listen to me, I choose to love the way that God loves me. And what that means is, is you'll never do anything that I don't want to stop loving you. Can I forget it? No, I can't forget it. There are things people have done that I can't forget. But I, I'm going to keep on loving you. You know why? That's the way God the Father treats me. 
And if you've experienced the love of God the Father, guess what? That love will never end inside your soul. And that love will manifest it itself in the way that you treat other people. Love endures. If we were able to look through the lens of Jesus Christ, listen to me, if we could see like Jesus sees, Here's what the Bible says. That Jesus is God. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Jesus said over and over, if you've seen the Father, guess what? Uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? And the Bible says God's love. Right? Everybody loves that verse. God's love. Well, let me tell you something. Romans 5, 8 says that Jesus is the love of God the Father incarnate. It is the love of God in bodily form. It was birthed to show us the very essence of what God's love is all about. So let me paraphrase for you the first few verses of this chapter. May I? Okay. I want to say it in my way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and I don't have Christ, I am making a bunch of noise like sounding brass in a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of knowledge or prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge of this world, and though I would be willing to have all the faith that would remove the very base of every mountain, and I don't have Christ, I am nothing. Amen. And even though I give absolutely everything I have in my house and my bank account to feed the poor folk, and I allow myself to even become a martyr and die for Jesus Christ without love. I am nothing. It's for naught. Jesus, let me tell you, he suffers long and he's kind. Jesus never envies. Jesus doesn't hold himself in high regard. Jesus does not behave himself wrongly in absolutely anything. Jesus never thought about evil things. Jesus did never rejoice in sinful actions. No. Jesus rejoiced in the truth. Jesus bore all things. Jesus believed all things. Jesus hoped all things. Jesus endured all things. Jesus will never fail. Amen. You cannot separate Jesus and the word love because it embodies all that he is. So now, listen to me, now, right now, with this book that we call the Bible being completed from Genesis to Revelation, right now with the completed word of God, let me tell you something, the perfect has already come. We do not need the things that the early church needed to take the message of Jesus. We have all that we need right here. And right here, the Holy Spirit inside us to lead us and guide us and empower us and the very perfect Word of God that He has given us and translated by man into so many ways, there's no way that we cannot understand to know what God desires for us to do. Now, we have faith, hope, and love. And just those three. But I'm going to tell you this, the greatest of all of them, is love. The most, the most magnanimous of all of them is love. I can't get any bigger than that. Hallelujah! What a Savior! He's love demonstrated and given to us. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be just like Jesus in the way that we love. We love Him first and then we love others in the way that we love Him. The old song said, Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken for you and me. His hands were nail scarred. His side was riven. He gave His life blood. He gave His life blood. Listen to me. Jesus gave his life blood for even me. For even me. So now we have faith. Our trust in him. Now we have hope. 
in His blessed Word. And it is His promises. And the fact that He's going to come again one of these days. Amen? Now we have love, the greater of all of those gifts, forever here, right now. Now we have those gifts. But then, in <coughs> guess what? It changes. We won't need faith. You know why? Huh? <laughs> we'll have sight. I'll see Jesus face to face. I won't need to trust Him anymore. No more hope. You know why? We're going to be there. But I'll tell you this. When heaven is complete with God's perfect plan, one gift remains. Love. Love. So what's perishing? What's become obsolete? What is going to end? Well, verse 8. Here's what he says. Whether there are prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there are tongues, they'll cease. Whether there's knowledge, it'll vanish away. So real quickly, let me explain to you what that means. There will come a time when the prophecies would cease or end. It's interesting when you look at the language because you get a little better idea of what Paul's trying to say here. When he uses that word, he says prophecies will fail. It's an interesting Greek word, car to gay up. It means to render to inactivity. In other words, it'll stop. There's not going to be any active prophecy like there was in the old days. God had a message for his children, Israel. You know how he got that message to them? Through the prophets. He did. And, and God chose early on in the New Testament time, when Jesus had come and established his church, God chose through the Holy Spirit to send that prophecy into the hearts and the minds of these men that we know as the apostles. Well, there come a time when prophecy is going to be out of business. The completed word comes along. Why do you need the prophecy anymore? You got it right here. And he says love never fails. That word fail is a different word than car to gayo. It's pipto. It's the same word that he uses oftentimes, Paul does, in the New Testament when he refers to the Word of God. In its smallest of detail, let me tell you something, in the smallest of detail, you go to the shortest verse of the Bible in, in the Gospel of John, it says Jesus wept. In, in the smallest of detail, Jesus cried. And let me tell you something. You know what that says? That that's the final authority. Jesus cried. You can say, well, he shed a tear. I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says he cried. He bawled like a baby probably. But it's pipto that it never loses its authority. Another way it's used is, is in Luke 16 and 17. And it uses that same word. It doesn't fail. And it's interesting. There the connotation is, is you're the bad actor. And you know what happens to bad actors, don't you? They get hissed off the stage. <laughs> Boo! They throw rotten tomatoes at them. Well, guess what? Not the Word of God. It's perfect. Not love. It's perfect. It's never the bad actor. James 1.11 says it'll never lose its petal like the withered flower. You know why? Because the love of, listen to me, the love of God is fresh and new every day. Every day that you wake up and you open your eyes and you breathe and you know that you've done those things, guess what? God's telling you, I love you. Yeah. I love you. I love you. Can you imagine what that's like? Every day it's a new and fresh <laughs> speaking of God that he loves you. Can you imagine what it's like for Miss Hazel sitting back there? Can you hear me, Miss Hazel? Yeah? Can you imagine she's 96 years old? Can you imagine knowing that for 96 years somebody ciphered? Go ahead, Shane. Get on, get on your phone. Figure it out. No, no, 96 years. Listen, 96 years. Go 96 times 365. And you going to pull your phone up or not? I asked you to. Oh, you don't have your phone? Oh, okay. uh, I'd like to know how many times God has told Hazel, 
I love you. Just over 35,000 times. No, that's wrong. No. No. 36,596. Is that what it is? 31,596. Okay. 35,040. Okay. All right, I'm not going to argue with the computer. Can you imagine? How many times have I said I love you, sweetheart? 43 years times... 300 and... No, no. I ought to, but no. Can you imagine? Now, God says that. God's love never ends for you. But I'm going to tell you something. Prophecy, it ceased. When John wrote the last words of the gospel book, we know. I call it the gospel because it tells the story of Jesus. But Revelation, I guess what? That's it. God says, I love you. It's complete. Prophecy was put out of business. Did you know that there would be an end to tongues? <coughs> tongues, honestly, tongues, the gift of tongues that we know in the Bible actually ceased before the Bible was ever completed. You know how I know that? The Bible says that tongues were assigned. You know who they were assigned to? To the Jews. Because the Jewish people, God's chosen people, said, I don't want to hear the story of Jesus. I don't want to hear about what he's done. I don't care about anything. And God gave the early church the gift of tongues so that they could hear, they could hear and say, wow, that can't be nobody but God. And long before the Bible was completed, that gift had already ceased. Man has tried to raise it up, but I'm going to tell you something. According to the Bible, and then he says, an end to knowledge. It'll vanish away. You know, the knowledge that God gave these early men were not, was knowledge that they didn't have to study about. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm pretty unlearned, and I am an old country boy. But what I've learned, I've had to dig to learn it. It just didn't come. And I will never stand up here, I promise you, I won't stand up here and tell you. Well, I didn't know what in the world I was going to preach until 9.45 today. And when I came up here to the church, God just, boom, he just gave me a message. No. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A worker that doesn't want to be ashamed of what he says, but rightly divides the word of truth. The gift of knowledge was an incredible thing for this early church. You know why? Listen, the church at Corinth, at 65 AD, the word of God had, wouldn't be completed for another 30 years. They needed God to put knowledge in there to be able to tell the church what God desired. God was putting knowledge in the heart of this man, the Apostle Paul, when he writes this letter to the church at Corinth. It was important. But guess what? When this book was completed, when John closed out the Revelation book, guess what? The Holy Spirit said, boom, that's it. Benny. That's it, closed. But he gave a warning before he closed the book. He said, if anybody tries to add anything to this book, if anybody tries to take away anything from this book, I'll add to you, Jesus, I'll add to you the plagues that are in there and read them. They're awful. And I'll take away his part into the Lamb's book of life. The Holy Spirit closed the book forever. And guess what? This becomes our rule, our guide, our roadmap for what we believe, our faith, and how we act, our practice. That is important, Father. The other gifts would cease. And then he gives a definite explanation. He says, you know what the problem with partial knowledge is? You don't get the whole story. Bits and pieces came. Bits and pieces. Every letter in the New Testament was written over time. They just had bits and pieces. But he said the time would come when there would be perfect knowledge. He says in verse 10, the perfect <coughs> will come. I love that word. But I'm going to tell you something, folks, as I've said it a couple of weeks ago. The devil's had a heyday with it. Because people look at that and they say, okay, when Jesus comes back, no, no. 
What's the subject matter here? Gifts and knowledge. You follow me? Gifts and knowledge. He doesn't talk about the second coming of Jesus to chapter 15. So don't try to take something out of context. It's the laws of interpretation. What's he saying? Gifts and knowledge. That's the subject matter. And he says when that perfect has come, then all those partial things, all those partial gifts, they're going to cease to exist. The perfect. That word is teleos. Now listen to me. Here's how you break it down. Telos means the end. Phineas means nothing beyond. Do you know what God says to me there? That when Revelation was completed, guess what? There's nothing beyond that that you need to look at. You have the perfect completed word of God. You understand how important that is? Because we go out and search for other things. But let me tell you something. God says this is all you need. You know what God says? Listen to me. I'll be honest with you. God says don't, don't you listen to everything Buddy Ritter says. Not unless it coincides. Not unless it runs parallel to this book. Don't you believe everything Bernie Hughes says in Sunday school class. God, don't you believe everything Charlie says. Okay? <laughs> Unless what Charlie or Vernon or anybody else says runs parallel and coincide and adds up and agrees with this book, don't you believe it? Because this is God's perfect plan for you and I. He completed it and he's gave it to us in such an incredible way. Study the history of this book. How many thousands of people died to preserve this book so you and I could read it. Oh my goodness. It's incredible. And then he gives their, uh, us an illustration. He says, when I was a child, I love this one because when I do childish things, sometimes I refer to it, but when I was a child, I spoke like a child. My, my, die, die. Those are words from a child. I thought as a child, trust me, I acted like a child. When I, when I learned Lottie Moon's story, I thought, my goodness, what a cut up her and I would have been. But God chooses to save and call to ministry cut up. So there's hope for you, Holden. Okay? <laughs> just, just hang on with it. But, but do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? When you look at this scripture and you take it all in, you understand that there's a time to be a baby. There's a time to be a child. But let me tell you something. There's a time to grow up. Amen. And, 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 and I spoke as a child. I acted <coughs> like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, when I became full grown, and that was probably, what, about 35 years old? Took her a while to raise me. Okay? When I became a man, it was time to put away childish things. Now, now church, now, uh, visitors, we're delighted that you're here, but this is not for you. Okay? But church members, listen to me. You listening? Got your ears on, good buddy? There's a time for us to mature. And there's a time to put the toys away. There's a time for us to move on and do the mature things. Now, if you're struggling with what the mature thing is, let me tell you what it is. It's to love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And then love others as much as you love yourself. And when you get those two commandments out of the way, we'll talk about all the others. I ain't got there yet. So, I can just tell you what they are like, but I ain't got past the first two. I'm still learning. But when you mature, you are going to start loving and forgiving and living life the way Jesus lived it. You don't need toys. You don't need a pacifier. You don't need a pacifier. You know what you need? You need to pick up a book and read it. 
and learn from it. Listen, ah, I just forget the sermon. <laughs> Let me tell you, Charlie, I'm going to pick on you because I love you. <laughs> you, you knew when I come out, like, oh no, I can see it on your face. Yes, I said, oh no. <laughs> But I love Charlie. But let me teach you what. Charlie's job is not to give these guys popsicles and pacifiers. Charlie's job is to help raise these young men. Like that young, <laughs> young men. Teach them how to love the Lord. How to love each other. How to love others. That's your job. Listen. There's a time to play with toys. But there's a time to grow up and be mature. And whether it's in church or whether it's outside, listen, it's time to man up. Or an old preacher friend of mine say, buddy, it's time to bow up. Time to bow up and take it like a man. And to learn and to do and to be what mature people believe. Paul would say in Ephesians, to the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ, maturity. Once there was a time that we looked through the glass dimly. In other words, we couldn't see very clear. But let me tell you something. Right now, face to face, we see what God wants us to do. So we need to bow up, mature, and do what God says to do. And you know what he says to do? That's to love him supremely and to love others. That's to love the way he loves. That's to forgive the way he forgives. That's to serve the way he serves. That's to sacrifice like he has taught us to sacrifice. So here's my question to you. I'll shut up. What is your love Quotient. A one being the lowest and ten being the highest. How much do you love the Lord? Right now. How much are you in love with the Lord? Because if you ain't banging that thing at the top on number ten, like the old, they don't do it anymore, I don't guess, but if you go to the fair, you know, and they had the big old club, and you hit the little pedal, and that thing went up and hit that ding. If you're at the top, if you're a 10 in your love for the Lord, God bless you. <clears throat> Every once in a while I ding the bell, but a lot of times I don't. And if you're at the bottom, guess what? If you're halfway, you need to talk to the Lord about it. Now, let's go to step two. Watch your love quotient with other people. One the lowest, ten the highest. What is your love quotient with others? Because the second greatest commandment is to love others. Right? How are you loving your wife or your husband? Your son or your daughter? How are you showing love to your brother or sister? Got any sisters? No? No sister? Oh, you got a sister. Yeah, you got a sister. I was pointing to him. I was going to pick on him. No, okay. I know there's a brother and sister back there because you all look too much alike, right? How you loving on your sister and brother? Huh? How you loving on your neighbor? How you loving on your co-worker? Maybe they don't do what you say. You still love them? Show them love, Jeff? Or Yeah. Hey, kids, you're going back to school. I hate to break the news to you. Choose you probably. How, you, how do you love when you classmate? Are you showing them love? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. We ain't supposed to be here. We ought to be ringing the bell. You know how I know? That's the pinnacle of it right there. It was great that he came in a manger. And it's great to see a pile of gifts. For missionary. I'm going to tell you something. That right there will always be supreme. God loved you so much.
that he gave his one and only son. That's how much he loves you. So where are you in your love quotient? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're a good, great God. And your love is everlasting. And it endures absolutely everything. But lonely, but Lord, it's only as good as we're willing to let you touch our hearts and our souls. And to change us from the deepest part of who we are to experience your love that radiates to our fingers, our hands, our toes, our feet, our mouths, our eyes, our ears, so that we can love our spouses, our brothers and sisters, one another. And God, I pray that we would walk away here knowing that your love never fails. It never, ever runs out on any of us. That Jesus, you're the embodiment of that love and what we see in your eyes, in your life, in your death, in your resurrection, and in your coming again is the fact that we have to, we must love you with all of our hearts and souls and minds. And that we must love others. We must be forgiving like you forgive us that we must be caring for others as you care for us, that we must be giving to others like you have given to us, Lord Jesus. And wherever we are on that scale, Lord, of love, whether high, in the middle, or down low, God, help us. Show us today how to love the way you love us. Help our love for others to never run out. And Father, I pray that as we think of where we are, that we would be willing to just simply say to you, Lord, I'm sorry. I left my first love for you. And it's just not been there for a while. Please forgive me. Or maybe like this church, Lord, that we've fallen in love with other things rather than the thing that's most important. And that's you, Jesus, and others. God, help us to reposition that so that we can claim the bell once again. I pray this in your sweet name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If there's something on your heart that you would like to experience,